Amen, amen. Well, good morning, church. Really honored to be in the pulpit. Um, one, one final time here at Fifi. So thankful um, to be able to gather together and worship with you this morning. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Psalms. And we're going to look at chapter 145. So Psalm 145. So as you are turning there, uh, just something that that I want to make sure that we mentioned this morning is, you know, one part of worship, one act of worship that we do is we give our offering to the Lord. And so if you're with us here in person, there are different boxes that you can drop off um, your tithe or your offering in those boxes as you leave the sanctuary this morning. If you're joining us online, We're so glad that you are, and you can give online through our app or through our website, or you can mail in that tithe or offering. So there's a lot of different ways for us to worship the Lord, and one way is through our giving. Now, as you are turning to uh, the book of Psalms, and as you're getting there, as we've been walking through uh, the Psalms the last couple of weeks and looking at how, different ways that we can give glory to the Lord. If you remember last week in particular, as we had uh, Regina here from Hearts for Ukraine, and she got to share during our Bible study hour, we looked at uh, a missionary psalm, Psalm 67, and how when God blesses us, He blesses us for a purpose. And that blessing, that purpose, is so that we can then be a blessing to others. And so as we think about that and how we as a church can be a blessing to others, I think we're, we're going to learn something as well from this psalm. Because as I was thinking and praying, and what did I want my last sermon to be? And I was trying to, you know, thinking about some of these different things. And then right away, I was drawn to Psalm 145. Because what Psalm 145 is, Psalm 145 is David's final psalm. So as David lived this long, full, incredible life, as he did so much for the Lord, this, uh, these are the final words that we have written down from David. And David, being David with this psalm, he had to add a, a little something extra to it. And so even in the original Hebrew of this psalm, he made it an acrostic. So each verse almost, except for verse 13, we'll see. It's kind of split in half. You got a noon um, there, but it's alphabetically going through the Hebrew alphabet. So he writes this beautiful acrostic poem. You know, David wrote, of the 150 Psalms, he wrote almost half of them. And then here we see what he determines are his final words. And I know I was challenged and encouraged by what he wrote. So with that kind of context in mind, I want to invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. Uh, my good friend Jonathan's going to be reading for us from Psalm 145. I exalt you, my God, the King, and bless your name forever and ever. I will bless you every day. I will praise your name forever and ever. The Lord is great and is highly praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation will declare your works to the next and will proclaim your mighty acts. I will speak of your splendor and glorious majesty and your wondrous works. They will proclaim the power of your awe-inspiring acts, and I will declare your greatness. They will give a testimony of your great goodness and will joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and great in faithful love. The Lord is good to everyone. His compassion rests on all he has made. All you have made will thank you, Lord. The faithful will bless you. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom and will declare your might, informing all people of your mighty acts and of the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your rule is for all generations. 
The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his actions. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. God, we love you so much, and we are so thankful for your word. And God, as we have the honor and privilege of gathering together as your body this morning, I pray that, Lord, you'd be so kind to remind us of how great you are this morning. Lord, remind us how you alone are worthy to be worshiped, worthy to be praised. So I pray, God, that you would just, Lord, remove distractions from this place, Lord, that you bind the enemy from here. God, I pray you'd hide me behind your cross, that you would speak. I pray, God, you would turn. Lord, our minds, attention, and our hearts, affection to you and to your word. We ask for your spirit to be at work. We love you, Lord. So your son's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. So these are David's last words. It's going to be interesting to see what he focuses on. And I, what I did is I did, I did a little, little search and I was looking at what are some other famous last words? What have some people shared, right? And so Emily Dickinson, this is what she said, her last words, I must go in, the fog is rising. Thomas Edison, he said this, it's very beautiful over there. Don't know exactly what he's talking about. Jane Austen, this is a little interesting, but she very simply said at one point, she said, I want nothing but death. Bob Marley, I thought this was interesting. He said, money can't buy life. Oscar Wilde, I thought this was pretty funny. He was in his room, and he apparently did not like the wallpaper. He said, either that wallpaper goes or I do. <laughs> Karl Marx, he had, uh, it was like a nurse or a housekeeper came in and asked him, does he have any final words? And this is what he said to her. Go on, get out. Last words are for fools who have not yet said enough. <laughs> Beethoven, this was very poetic on his part, but he said, friends applaud, the comedy is finished. Interesting. Last two, Winston Churchill, I thought this was interesting. He just simply said, I'm bored with it all. <laughs> Sounds kind of like Churchill, right? Then I thought this one was, was appropriate to end with, but Benjamin Franklin said this. He said, a dying man can do nothing easy. <laughs> and so, as I was just thinking, what would my, my last sermon be? I knew in some ways it wouldn't be easy. But I thought as, I, as we look at David's words... We're going to see how his last words are so, I believe, encouraging to each and every one of us. Because if you notice, as Jonathan was reading just the first half or so of that psalm, and we'll look at all of it this morning, but what I notice as David wrote this final psalm, do you notice there's not a whole lot about David in this psalm, is there? David, who was one of the greatest kings ever. I would argue the greatest poet, songwriter ever. He was a conqueror. He was a warrior. He was incredible. Now, did he have his failures? Of course. But David had a lot to write about. And yet... As Jonathan was reading, did you hear any talk about David's conquests? 
Did you hear any talk about his power or his position? Or did you hear any talk about David's legacy? You notice where David turns all of his attention towards? He says that he is going to give glory to God. Look what he says. He starts, I exalt you, my God, the King, and bless your name forever and ever. I'll bless you every day. I'll praise your name forever and ever. What we see first right away in this psalm is we see that God gets the glory. God gets the glory. David's final psalm is not focused on his legacy. It's all about the Lord. This, uh, my, my final weekend here, I had, I say it's a blessing, it's also a responsibility of officiating two different memorial services. On, on Friday, maybe you heard that Shirley Downs passed. Then yesterday morning, it was, it was Fred Zarf's funeral. And as I was meeting with Karen and Freddie, although Freddie said we don't call him Freddie, he's Fred. So sorry. As I was meeting with them, it was really interesting what they said. They said, we want this to be a celebration. We want it to be a celebration. He is going home He's with the Lord. His body is fully restored. So you know, Fred battled ALS. And my, my joke to him was always, you know, Fred, I'm not supposed to covet. I'm a pastor. But Fred's voice was unbelievable, right? I said, I'm stuck with this, right? <laughs> and you've got that booming preacher voice. But I love that they said, it's going to be a celebration. They said, we want you to point people to Jesus. That's what Fred would want. And what I love about David, the final psalm that he writes, all he's talking about is, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will bless your name. That's what he says, forever and ever. I'll bless you every day. I'll praise your name forever and ever. David is declaring to all of us that God is worthy of worship for all eternity. For all eternity. So as we think about everything that God is doing in this great church we have to remember that really it's all about the Lord. And we want to bless His name every day, praise His name forever and ever. And then he continues on into verse 3 and following. He says, The Lord is great and is highly praised, His greatness is unsearchable. He says, I'm going to exalt you, God. I'm going to bless you. And then I'm going to declare how great you are, how you're worthy to be praised. And in fact, your greatness, God, is unsearchable. Then notice what he says in verse 4. I think this is really interesting. He says, one generation will declare your works to the next and will proclaim your mighty acts. So we need to make sure, David wants us all to make sure that it's all about God, that God gets the glory. Then you notice this encouragement that he gives us in verse 4. It's an encouragement and it's in a challenge. One generation will declare your works to the next and will, and will proclaim your mighty acts. 
Right there, packed into verse 4, we see two challenges from David to all of us that we need to both disciple and declare. We need to disciple and declare. I can remember when I was, when I was first coming here, you know, four years ago, and I was given a book, A Tree Firmly Planted, which was a book written about Fifi Baptist and its history. It's remarkable to be in a church with the legacy of Fifi, right? Over, I know, you know, we're at 215 years of God being faithful and good in this incredible church. And I loved reading through the history and seeing what God had done and how God had worked. And you know what? We need to share that story of this church and what God has done through it. But more than just the story of this church, what David is challenging all of us is that we need to make sure that everyone understands it's all about Jesus. It's all about God. He says, we need to declare your works and proclaim your mighty acts. One generation to the next. And really what we need to make sure is that we need to be intentional about discipling those who come after us. We need to be intentional about discipling those who come after us. We can't take anything for granted. If you remember, it was about a a decade ago now or so when Tim Tebow was playing in the national championship game for the University of Florida, and he had on his eye, on his eye black. Do you know what he had on his eye black? He had John 3.16. And do you know what happened that night on Google? The number one search on Google that night was John 3.16. And Really, what you can postulate from that is the fact people had to Google it because they didn't know what we would arguably say is the most famous verse in Scripture. People did not know what it said. Lifeway just came out with the most recent poll, and it shows that we are the most biblically illiterate generation in our country's history. You just talk about basic biblical knowledge We don't have it. We can't just assume that people are going to grow up and learn about the Lord. We're in a post-Christian culture right now. The, The days and times of us just lighting up a sign on the road and expecting for people to walk in the doors of the church, those days have come and they have gone. And so what are we going to do if one generation is going to declare God's work to the next? That means that we have to be intentional about getting outside of the walls of the church and sharing about the goodness of God to others. We also need to be intentional inside the church of pouring into the next generation and teaching them to love and to read, and to follow and obey God's Word. We can't take those things for granted. So what are we going to do, church, to make sure that we instill God's truth to the next generation? Let's mentor and let's disciple our kids and our grandkids. And I was challenged. We just have a, a family just been coming to our church for the last couple of months. And they came and they asked us, they said, you know, we, we, need, our, we need our kids. They have three boys. They said, we need them to have some adopted grandparents. I thought, that's wonderful. But not just them, but there are so many kids that need that, right? That need to have godly men and women with wisdom pouring into them and instilling God's truth and God's word. 
unto them. And this is what David, in the midst of him declaring how great God is, he lets his, you know, he lets Israel know, he's letting all of us know that it is our responsibility, one generation, notice he doesn't say, should declare your works the next, but he says, one generation will declare your works to the next, and will proclaim your mighty acts. We should testify and sing about God's goodness and about his mighty acts. We need to share about who God is and what God has done. And you know, one great way for us, if we want to testify and sing about God's goodness, if we want to testify and sing about God's mighty acts, one way for us to do that is just to be saturated in His Word. Just to be saturated in His Word. I've really enjoyed as we've been going through praying the Bible on Wednesday nights. I want to encourage you to come still be a part of that. Jonathan is going to be leading us this Wednesday night. We need to be saturated in the Word, praying the Word, and seeking God's face, declaring who He is to others. And then what David does after he challenges us to, to proclaim these, notice what he says, he says, I'll speak of your splendor and glorious majesty, your wondrous works. They'll proclaim the power of your awe-inspiring acts. I will declare your greatness. They'll give a testimony of your great goodness, and they will joyfully sing of your righteousness. He's saying we testify, we sing, we declare all the goodness of God. And then look at how he kind of transitions in verse 8. And then he's going to give us a reminder of God's character and God's goodness. And in fact, what he does here is, let's just read verse 8. He says this, the Lord is gracious and compassionate slow to anger and great in faithful love. Do you know what David's doing right there in verse 8? Is David's quoting back to Exodus 34. When, you know, Moses had, had asked God to see his glory, right? As, 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 Dave, as, as God is passing by and he declares this statement. He declares who he is. So what David is doing is he goes back and he's reciting for us, reminding us what God said about himself, that the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding, or great in faithful love. Aren't you so glad that our God is a God of grace and compassion? That our God is slow to anger? I'm thankful for that. And David just steps back and he says, one thing that sets our God apart is how gracious he is to each and every one of us. He's great in faithful love. I love the ESV, I believe it says, it says he's abounding in steadfast love. As we think about that, we just have to step back. We have to remember God revealing himself in his character. And what better way does God reveal himself than through the cross of Christ? Who when all of us were stuck in our sin and lost in the muck and the mire, were dead in our transgressions, the Bible says, then God, who's rich in mercy, made us alive through Christ. He sent his son to die on the cross, to pay the penalty for your sins and for mine. It's incredible. Look what David, he continues, he says, the Lord is good to everyone. His compassion rests on all he has made. All you have made will thank you, Lord. The faithful will bless you. They'll speak of the glory of your kingdom, will declare your might, informing all people of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your rule is for all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his actions. So it's our job, we understand from David, to declare the truth of who God is and what he has done to all people. 
One commentator says in this, the second half of this psalm, he says what David does, and we know David was an incredibly emotional guy, right? But he says, he's, he says in David's final words, what he's communicating to all of us is David wants us to understand that we trust the facts of God over our feelings. And I love that. He says, we trust the facts of who God is over our own feelings. Because there are times we'll go through difficult circumstances. He says, it's so good. And while David, in his final words, he just starts declaring all of these truths about God. So we need to trust the facts of who God is over any feelings that we might have to try to point us otherwise. Now, though, back in verse 7, he says, you'll give a testimony of your great goodness and you'll joyfully sing of your righteousness. One incredible way that we can declare who God is and what he's done is through our voices, through song. It says this in Colossians 3, verse 16. Look at Paul writes, he says, let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. And look how he says we're going to teach and admonish one another through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. So as we disciple others and as we declare the truth of God, one way that we do this that both David says and we see Paul says as well as we sing the truths of God. We sing the truths of his word. There's things about when you memorize something in a song, it just sticks with you, doesn't it? And so what David reminds us and what Paul is telling us is, hey, as we declare that truth, let's sing boldly the truths of God's Word. And whether it was a song or a psalm written, you know, 2,000 years ago or it was a song written two days ago, as long as it's biblical and it's declaring God's truth, let's sing it and let's proclaim it and let's declare who God is. So we'll sing His Word. We'll share it with others. Then what David does, let's read just the rest of the psalm, and I love what he does here. He just starts talking about how good God is again. He says, the Lord helps all who fall. He raises up all who are oppressed. All eyes look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all his acts. The Lord is near all who call out to him. And all who call out to him with integrity, he fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cries for help, and he saves them. The Lord guards all those who love him, but he destroys all the wicked. And he ends by saying this, my mouth will declare the Lord's praise. Let every living thing bless his holy name forever and ever. David wants us again to be reminded that only God is worthy. Only He is worthy. Just look at everything God, excuse me, everything that David says about the Lord here in these last few verses. He says that God provides. He says that God satisfies. He says that God is near to all who call out to Him. Look what it says in verse 19. He fulfills the desires of those who fear Him. He fulfills our desires. It says that he hears our cries, and he saves us in verse 19. He hears our cries. And the Lord guards all those who love him. 
Aren't you thankful for all the ways that God is at work in our lives? I think this is so, so interesting. A little bit funny. He's saying all these great things. You help all those who fall. Then I love verse 15. All eyes look to you. You give them their food at the proper time. I've got three kids. Have you ever seen a a kid that's hangry? Yeah, when are they not hangry? Yeah, yeah, when are they not, not like, I don't, I don't understand. I, I said, okay, I'm going to have to get two more jobs just to pay for snacks, right? But I love those Snickers commercials. You know, you're not you when you're hungry, right? And David is saying all these great things about God. And man, he saves us. He's our guard. He protects us. And then I just love this. He just drops us in there. He's, man, all eyes look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. God provides for every single one of our needs. And just the fact that we have food to eat, David says that is just another great reason to praise God. I love David for a lot of reasons, but right here I feel like he's telling us that we can praise God for steak and fajitas, right? I love it. But much deeper than that, he's just saying, look at all the ways that God is faithful to you and to me. And the little things like food, he's there. And the bigger areas of this whole idea of If you cry for help, he will save you. What an incredible promise, isn't it? The Bible tells us that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved, no matter what you've done. The Bible tells us that if we'll simply repent and call out to God and say, God, I need you. I'm a sinner, and I need to be saved by your grace. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that incredible? And then David ends after declaring all these great things about what God does, how he provides, how he's satisfied, how he's near, how he's righteous, how he fulfills our desires, hears our cries, how he guards those who love him. His last written words that we have, verse 21. You notice what he says? My mouth will declare the Lord's praise. Let every living thing bless his holy name forever and ever. David ends this psalm the same way he begins it, by giving glory to God. You notice uh, all throughout the psalm, he uses all these different words to proclaim, to talk about how we can praise God. In verse 1, he says that we are to exalt God. And that really means just to tell God God, how great he is. We're to exalt him, it says in verse 1. It also says in verse 1 that we're to bless God, and that means that we need to speak well of God and his, gener- and his generosity. And in verse 2, it says that we're to praise his name. We glorify God for his magnificent qualities. Then we go on and we see that it says that we are to declare how great God is. That means to speak highly of him. God, David also tells us to proclaim, to speak, to give testimony, to joyfully sing, to give thanks. Over and over and over again, David, in his last words, he says this, it's all about Jesus. Let's worship him with all that we have. Our only response to our great God should be to worship him forever. And so, church, I I love this place. And I'm going to miss you dearly. But I'm so thankful that we can join together and give glory and honor and worship and praise to the Lord. This is God's church. 
And God is going to continue to do incredible things through Fifi. I love that idea of how we just want to build our lives on Jesus, and we, we want to pursue the good of our community for the glory of God. And I cannot wait to hear and to see about what God does in and through this incredible church in its next season. Transition is never easy, but God is so good, isn't he? And just like with David, for each and every one of us, it's my prayer that we will give glory to God forever. I'm thankful for him, and I hope you are too. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. God, we love you. God, we're so thankful for who you are and what you've done for us. And God, as we think about your son, Jesus, Lord, what a blessing for us to be able to worship you with our lives. So God, I thank you for this incredible church. And I just pray right now, Lord, if there's anyone in this room or anyone joining us online, Lord, that has never experienced your saving grace, I pray your spirit would be at work in their hearts even now. God, we're so thankful that we can worship you and praise you for the rest of our lives and for all of eternity. We love you, Lord. In your son's name we pray, amen.